Uh, hello and welcome again, everyone, to Sales Intel's webinar on growth hacking, tips to scale from 1 million to 10 million and beyond. And I am so excited to have with us today Manoj Ramnani uh, from Sales Intel and Nicole Kelly from Windward. Uh, just I'll give you a moment to introduce yourselves. Great, great. Thank you so much, Ariana, And thanks everyone for joining us in. Um, my name is Manoj Ramnani. I'm the founder and CEO of Sales Intel. We provide sales intelligence platform you know, go for the go-to marketing team. And uh, with me, I'm excited to have Nicole. Thank you. I'm Nicole Kelly. I'm the VP of Growth for Windward Consulting Group. I've been leading marketing teams for the last couple of decades focused around hyper growth and hyper acceleration. I know this is awesome. I know, Manoj, you've built a lot of businesses uh, throughout your career. And Nicole, I know we've chatted about of just how to actually scale all of this. So how do you get from the MVP to actually scaling the company? And so that's what we're going to dive into this afternoon. Uh, so this was the original agenda that was a part of our event, which was lessons learned from entrepreneurs, hacking your growth, and then the live Q&A. And after talking with Manoj and and Nicole, we actually created this into a step-by-step -step item. So they're actually going to be going through all of those steps to make a more cohesive presentation. And with that, uh, Manoj, I'll hand it over to you. Thanks, Ariana. Really appreciate it. And once again, thanks everyone for joining in. You know, <clears throat> many companies never make it to a million dollars in revenue, right? Um, starting a company uh, is, is very, very easy. Scaling is difficult. But when you look at 5 million and then the 10 million, you know, less than 10% of the companies make it to $10 million. So what's the secret recipe? You know, I've tried many times in my first company, we could never get there. Second company, we got there. Third company, we got, got there in less than three years. So what we have done here is try to put some um, a key points as to what helped us grow this company from zero to 10 in you know, roughly two, two and a half years here. Um, so to make it digestible, look, everybody has their own recipe. Everybody has their own formula. To make it digestible, we have shared, Nicole and I, what has worked for us. Nicole has experienced scaling beyond 10 million, right? So she will share some of the nuggets with the, with the group here. But let's get started with these phases. So Nicole, anything to share here before we go yeah. to each phase? Yeah, I think um, you know, the focus really is you know you have to start somewhere. And then you have to set your first milestone. So, you know, we're really looking at, you've gotten to that first milestone of a million dollars. That's the first step, you're alive. Now we're looking to how we uh, leverage that to create success because the success starts to come in when you're able to scale the results that you've created. So a lot of startups, you know, don't get off the ground as Manoj said, but other startups fail in execution. So what I really hope to add value today is about how not to fail in execution. Yeah, no, very well put, very well put. And you know, mil zero to million um, almost gets from the founder's adrenaline, right? If you have a founder or a founder's founding team, they just jam through the wall to get to that million number. But how do you scale it, make a real company, right? So what I found is, uh, let's move to the first, first slide here, the phase one, um, building companies like building a house, right? You need a solid foundation and um, to build the foundation for the business, I boil it down to three foundational elements. Number one is your team, right? Building business is a, is a team sport. I wish I could do it alone, <laughs> but I can't. Building a company is a team sport. So you need the winning team. That's the first recipe. Or if you wanna do it all alone, it's hard. It's hard to build companies alone. Um, so step number one, go look for the team. You know, if you're a technical co-founder, look for the person who has, who has sales or marketing experience or vice versa. Um, second is once you have that initial team, build the cultural values, right? Agree among the co-founders or among the founding team members as to what is our culture? Who are we going to hire? What kind of behavior are we going to tolerate, right? And that's going to help you as you scale, because it's very easy to hire the first two, three, four, five, ten 10 people because you're involved in, uh, in every decision making. But as you scale the organization, unless you have defined those key cultural values, it becomes very hard to build the, the team. Like this year we are hiring 250 new team members, right? It's practically impossible for me to interview everybody. Right? So one thing that has helped is when we started Sales Intel almost three years ago, we built the foundational 
cultural value to say this is what we behave what we believe in this is the kind of behavior we are going to look for the new incomers that are coming in and this is the kind of behavior that we are not going to tolerate right if you have to part ways if somebody is not behaving and not living our cultural values it's okay right for us to part ways with them um and then the last point on the foundation is your brand um look steve jobs said if you don't have a brand um you are a commodity right there's so many companies that do what we do or so many companies that do what you do right we are not not unique but we try to put a unique touch in our services or our our product so ultimately i believe that uh, a brand internally and the uh, sorry the culture internally and the brand externally is your competitive advantage right if you are successful with the product or the services the economics theory says that others are going to come in the market right they're going to see you making money they're going to come to the market they're going to copy your product they're going to copy your um business model they're going to hack steal your people right you have no control on all of that but what you have control over is internally you build a solid culture and externally you build the brand that the customers trust right and with that you can scale the business Yeah, and the interesting thing about really hiring for culture is that a lot of times when companies are putting together these the culture piece, it becomes an after product. It becomes the we have we're going to build a culture around who our founders are, how our founding team is, but without the thought of who do we hire and how do we hire the right people. So what I found is that when you're trying to build culture, first you need to understand what's in the dna of that founding team like what's the drive that's pushing you forward how do you work together how do you communicate together what did you hate at every prior job that you've ever experienced what don't you want to build then you can start to figure out what it is that you want to build and when you start to build culture based on dna things that are core to the human experience now you know what to hire for so for example you might build a culture around emotional intelligence a culture that talks about feelings openly Well, if you're going to do that, then you need to hire people who already talk about their feelings openly. You can't necessarily hire people and train them how to talk about feelings. That takes too long. We're in startup phase. We need to hire the right people from the beginning and to do that, I find that focusing on human value in that culture is the winning formula. Absolutely. Absolutely. So, and once you Sorry, I was just going to turn it over to you. Yes, thank you. Thank you, Nicole. So once you have the culture and the brand and the team in place that to to the means the foundation, you know, what's next? The next to me is your product, right? Many people make presentations and, you know, put the put the uh, decks out there. I am of the opinion that put your 1.0 product out there. I know Nicole, you have worked very Uh, extensively on rapid prototyping i would love for you to share the share the experiences that you have with the group yeah so i rapid prototyping is how you scale it's how you accelerate and the first thing that you have to start doing is you need to you need to focus on building structured experiments if there's one thing that i see startups fail at it's that they don't structure the experiment ex- the experiment in a way that they can measure the result document the result and not repeat the experiment over and over and over again. Um so being able to actually make sure you're documenting those exper- experiments and then the way that I look at rapid prototyping is the first thing that you need to do is you need to know what you want to learn. Define the question you're trying to answer. Then you need to define how you're going to measure that you learned it. Not arbitrary metrics, but actually measuring that you learned the thing you asked you set out to learn. And then the final thing is that we build prototypes in 2 hours. So how can I build something in under 2 hours to test my idea? And then we layer prototypes. So the first the first prototype in market might be the answer to a question, but then we build out the next iteration. From that, the way we build out iterations is we create a feedback loop. And the, we ask two questions. It's so easy. What really works for you? What would make it better? And we limit it to that. with the exception of when it's a detailed piece we also might ask what do you want more of and what do you want less of by asking the same questions and keeping it simple we actually get the feedback that we need to iterate the next design and we do it in a way that doesn't it doesn't um break down the morale of the team sometimes we ask like it, the feedback can come across negative but because we're asking what really works we get both and it comes across in a way that the team can actually execute it that is really helpful you know in our world in the saas world 
we believe in progress over perfection, right? For the 1.0 version, product is always a work in progress, never complete. And um, the two of my favorite questions are, uh, what will make an existing customer pay more, right? And what will make a customer who's on the fence to come and become a prospect who's on the fence to become a customer, right? Mm -hmm. Yeah, those are great questions. Um, in terms of audience, one of the things that I find interesting is that as you're starting out, it's like you develop this buyer, this persona. But then the question is, how do you actually get to the buyer and the persona? And I know, Manuj, you do so much work in this space of how of finding the right um, target buyer. One of the things that I found most effective is there's kind of there's two approaches you can take to this. You can take the shotgun approach, which is we're going to go really wide out in the industry and we're going to just come back with a big list of people. And we call that, you know, the, the shotgun approach. And then we kind of spray and pray. And then you can also do a more targeted approach where you actually go in and start doing account based marketing where you're targeting specific companies. And then you do a, what we call a surround and drown approach where you go and you find all of the people in that organization who fit specific criteria. And then you put your brand in front of them a bunch of different times. Personally, I found that the account based marketing approach works best at the startup stage because you can focus your resources and your efforts. What have you found works best for sales intel? Yeah, absolutely. You know, as a startup, you don't have you know, infinite resources. So the limited resources that you have, you want to focus them, um, you know, in, in, in an area where you know you found your ICP, we call it, right? And uh, we actually help our customers, you know, over a thousand customers with our product who come in and define their ICP, define what's their target market, you know, the TAM analysis and ICP analysis. And we have found huge success, not only for us, but also for our customers who use the product to get, uh, get their, their core target markets. And then within the target market, who's the, the buyer persona. Mm -hmm. Excellent. So what comes after prototyping? Well, once you have the product, um, many companies, you know, let's take a step back. You know, my first company was a services company and we would do um, uh, consulting for, you know, federal government, state and local, and then we had a commercial practice. And we saw so many entrepreneurs with ideas and they had product and they will, they will invest anywhere from $100,000 to, you know, millions of dollars in developing a prototype. And they will get uh, um, so invested in the product development that marketing of that product becomes almost like an afterthought and they're exhausted by the time they got the perfect product. Right? I myself you know, found myself being a victim. I had multiple products that I built early on, um, but we could never get those products off the ground. Right? So the lessons learned from those failures have been that uh, get the 1.0 product out in the market and then leverage your partnerships. Right? You can have partners that you can go to market together um, because as a startup, once again, it reaches everything, your limited resources, you can't reach to, to, to the broader market. Second is figure out who is your better together, right? Uh, this is where the integrations comes in. Like early on with Sales Intel, we partnered with Salesforce, Marketo, HubSpot, Outreach, SalesLoft, and they these brands gave us such a huge exposure. And because we invested early on in integrations, the customers of those products became almost like our prospects, right? Um, so the, the point here is uh, figure out how are you going to reach to the broader market if your target market is that broad uh, in a very cost-effective way through partnership, whether it's selling together, marketing together, or integrating together. Yeah, when I look at partnerships, I like to find partners who have skin in the game. So as you start to look at, you know, these different types of partners, one of the things that you'll find is there's, there's often many people who will say, yeah, I'll totally do business with you, thinking that you're going to be, bring business to them. They'll certainly accept your money and all the clients you bring to them. But the question is, are they going to invest in you? And so I like to look for partnerships where you both have something to win. And the, and the win is a really big payoff so that you're willing to invest the time and energy. And instead of looking at a lot of partnerships, much like Manoj said, like, Pick the, pick the partners in the industry that are going to have the biggest potential to bring you customers versus you being the one that has to bring them all of the customers. Very good point. Very great point. You know, partnership is, is, a, is, is, is an art and a science together. For sure. <laughs> <laughs> and I 
great opportunity for growth. You know, when you're growing together and you can find that partner that will, um, you know, can really look at it in the long term, you can really grow quickly. Absolutely. Absolutely. We have been very fortunate at the product level. We have partnered, um, you know, we bring best of breed data. So um, you know, not to um, make this as a, as a infomercial, but uh, for sales Intel platform, we bring our contact in the company data that's world-class, right? Uh, but then we bring best of class technographic data with HG or intent data from Bambora, right? Or the news data from uh, uh, Crunchbase or Owler. And that gives a huge advantage to our platform, to our product, to our clients when they go to market, right? Because now they have world-class product in, in one place. And it's a win-win partnership because as we sign our customers, we are signing the customers on behalf of our partners and vice versa. Yeah. And I like how you're looking at it in terms of partnership, both on the product side and then also on the sales side, you know, like how can you find something that's going to add enough value in the product that people will pay more for it? And then how do you also um, add value into your sales funnel so that you can shorten your sales cycle? Yeah, absolutely. It's uh, it's in the fabric of our company. You know, I learned my lessons and uh, as we uh, put our go-to-market plan together. That was a strategy. Let's go through partnership as a product side, integrations, as well as go-to-market. Yeah. So where do we go for phase four? You know, the, the old saying of, uh, if you build, they will come. It is true, but they need to know. <laughs> they need to know about your, uh, about your product, about your solution, about your services, right? Every now and then, you can stumble upon the Facebook uh, idea, or you can stumble upon a Twitter or a LinkedIn or Instagram. But for every Facebook, LinkedIn, Twitter, there are millions of companies that never see the, the daylight, right? Um, and if you study even Facebook and LinkedIn and Twitter and Instagram, their success stories, um, you know, there's multiple books written on them. Even they invested a ton of energy in getting the word out there, right? Um, and, and what I uh, tell young entrepreneurs or even our team that uh, it's not a one trick pony to get the, get the marketing and the reach. You have to have the multi-channel approach. Uh, you know, we have six different channels that we use to get the word out there, to get the prospects, right? Whether it's a paid to earn media, to our PR channels, to social channels, and uh, to, to the email. And even this marketing, right? This what we are doing with this webinar, um, is, is yes, of course we are helping the community and sharing what we have learned, but with that very subtly, our brand is going out to hundreds and thousands of people. Yeah. It's interesting. Cause you know, you build it and they don't come a lot of times. <laughs> Most of the time you don't come. <laughs> yeah. Uh, for a lot of startups, they just really don't come. And so the question is why don't they come? And you know, we talked about the culture piece, we talked about the brand piece, but it really comes to distributing your product in the market. So when I look at, you know, marketing and reach, the first question I ask is what's your, what's going on in sales? Because if I were to invest in any area first, I would invest in the sales process and making sure that I have sales people who don't need marketing in order to make the engine work. Because you never, you can hire two kinds of salespeople, those that have leads, and those who need, need leads. And so I like to hire salespeople who are focused on being able to build their own book of business so that marketing becomes icing on the cake. Because one of the things that happens in the startup world is that it takes a while for the engine to get to a point where it delivers. I, the, there is a, the first year of the marketing engine is pure investment. And the return on that investment, it's gonna come in year two, year three, year four, and year five. Um, so really when I look at marketing for startups, I focus on how do we enable the sales process and that marketing team is directly aligned to supporting the sales, the sales team through the F, through things like whether they need product sheets, whether they need email series, like we do a very conversational marketing approach that you can't even tell it's marketing. It looks like a salesperson sending you a regular conversation. You wouldn't even know they're in sales. That's what actually works. It's not the pretty marketing flicks. I've never closed a deal because I had a pretty marketing flick. I've closed a deal because I was able to start a conversation. So the marketing approach is really to support that sales conversation. Then once you start looking at doing a fundraising and scaling, 
that's when you start to really look at, okay, how do we build an engine that will deliver? And we start looking at content marketing. We start looking at omni-channel marketing at that point, but you've got to get, you're looking to scale conversations. Um, and a lot of times uh, from a marketing perspective, we start looking at the lead, but we actually are trying to have conversations. That's what matters. Yeah, yeah Nicole, and you know, to, to, to your point, I think it depends upon the, the size of the deal and the market that you're working on. Yeah. In our case, Sales Intel, look, our market is huge, right? Mm-hmm. The TAM is huge. Every company that is in business that has sales and marketing team, they need our platform, right? Um, so, you know, we have 100% sales team, but, but we don't put them on the street. In fact, my first investment was we went and acquired a digital marketing company when we started three years ago. So Ariana, um, is, is, you know, we are so fortunate to have Ariana on our team that she came along with that acquisition. And that gave, the, gave us the, the foundation to get the word out there before even the product was out there. Um, so I think if your if you're, um, product price is in six figures, seven figures, right? Then you probably start with the conversation in year two, you start the marketing. But if you have a SaaS product, which is transactional sale, right? We close about 100 clients every month, you know, for, for example. Um, so we need the transactional, yeah. for the transactional sales, we need the top of the funnel. And in our business, marketing leads the message and then the sales takes those MQLs and tries to have the conversation and closes the deal. Yeah, it's very interesting. And it's the difference between products and services, right? Um, and it, depending on what your market is and what kind of a sales process you have, whether it's a consultative sale or a transactional sale, you can have totally different engines. Um, and as long as you're setting the engine up to deliver what you need in the end, which is a closed customer, um, then it's all going to work out. But looking at each one of those touch points and making sure that you're adding value is really the key. Good point. Good point. So shall we move to phase five? Yeah. So, uh, you know, you can never build a uh, sustainable business and uh, especially in the SaaS side, uh, an ever growing business with a leaky bucket. Um, so one thing that I was actually late in, in our business with the sales Intel was building the, the customer success team, the, the renewal team, right? Now we have a world-class team led by Chelsea Madden and um, uh, but I wish I had done that, you know, six months prior. So the other lesson learned for scaling the business, especially in the SaaS, is is um, get to get to that uh, customer success role, get to that account management role, and really put that team in parallel to your sales team, right? Where your sales team is closing the business and, and handing it over to the customer success team to give that world class experience so that your brand is top of mind for the, for the client who's coming on board and then have your account management team grow that account. So, you know, the hunters and the farmers um, uh, uh, parlance in the hunter and, par- and the farmer parlance, you have the hunters bring the account and then you have the farmers grow that account. And in the SaaS business, it works phenomenally, right? Because if you can keep 90, 95% of your business, then this just scales. It's the easiest way to get to your hundred million dollars ARR. Yeah, really interesting. I think, you know, as we look for um, scale, the important in customer success is you can basically grow a business two ways with your customers. You can get your existing customers to spend more money or you can get them to purchase more often. And Manuja's case, you can really only purchase once, right? So it's about having add-ons and upgrades for that customer. But in other markets, um, you might have other products and services that you can look at bundling. You can look at packaging things together. Um, so when I look at, you know, how to market back into the customer base, I'm looking for those two opportunities and how we can position both of them uh, in order to increase customer revenue. So we start to look at an average uh, revenue per customer. We start to look at lifetime value of customer and things like that. One of the things that I think is really important is this is where metrics start to get really important because as you scale, you need to learn how to pick winners and losers. And the only way you can pick win- winners and losers is you're actually measuring the results of what you're doing. So looking at how you can measure the entire funnel from the marketing um, of the product all the way through customer acquisition, through customer engagement, and then looking at customer retention on the back, on the back end. One of the metrics that I've found is really effective here is to start measuring costs. Because as you're starting to scale, you're looking at cost efficiency in all of your channels. So we look at things like 
um, cost per, you know, we look at CPM, but we also look at cost per engagement from a marketing perspective. We look at cost per lead, cost per acquisition. And then we start to look at, um, you know, on the customer side, we start to look at things like revenue per customer, um, how long they're actually engaged with us. Are they engaging or are they falling off? I'm sure, Manoj, you've experienced where you close a customer and then they never use the product or they don't use the product effectively. So we look at how we can get them in product or in, in working directly with consultants so that they're actually experiencing that. And we found that the more we can get the customer involved and engaged, the more successful they are on the back end. Yep, yep, yep. We have we have distilled it down to two phases. One is engagement, right? You bring the customer to the product. Say CS is all incentivized to engage the customer and giving them the ROI. You know, there's investing, uh, whatever, whether it's fifteen thousand dollars or hundred thousand dollars, they're investing in your product. Our goal is to make sure that they get ten x of the of the return on that, right? And um, so that's the the engagement side of metric. And then the second is the financial side. You know, we have. A, our accounting people are always looking at that CAC to LTV ratio because at some point, you know, we have to return, you know, make the return for our investors. So those are financial metrics. But if you focus on the product metrics, engagement metrics, the financial metrics will take care of itself. Yeah, for sure. So, oh, we're at Q and A. <laughs> that was so awesome, Manoj. Thank you. No, I enjoyed it. Thanks. Yeah. Happy well, to answer any questions from, you know, take some questions from our uh, group here and feel yeah. free to you know, reach me on LinkedIn or, or follow me on Twitter or uh, send me an email. You know, I'd love to talk to entrepreneurs and, uh, um, you know, other growth leaders who are growing the business, learn from them, you know, as we make our journey from 10 to 100 and uh, also share what I've learned. Yeah, same. And just remember, my name has an H, so it's Nachali. <laughs> Love it, Nicole. Uh, we do have one question in the q and I'll go ahead and do that. And I love this because it's such a great question. How do you keep the owner or founder from falling in love with his or her product or service so they can totally ditch it if needed? So that also goes back to product market fit. So I'd love to get your insights about that. I recently had an experience where we had the product, we're, we're pivoting one of the companies that I'm working with. And um, and basically it was a situation where we realized that it, the product was not the right product for the market. And we were having a hard time finding buyers. And we realized that the, the infrastructure of the product was good, but the target market was wrong. And so, um, in that situation, it required market research, you know? So the first question was, is this hunch that we have even right? And so then we looked at how we could validate that assumption. So we did a market research study, found that the assumption was correct. And then we started pivoting the entire product. I was very fortunate that the CEO is very open to market research. And he also was very aware that, the, that, that we had this challenge. So he's very open to it because the, the, we had reached a point where something had to change with the pandemic. You've got companies, we're trying to stay, keep companies in business here. Um, so we had to make a, a major shift. So I think for me, I think market research is the key to making sure that you're looking at objective analysis. Yep, yep. And, and to, to me, putting that product out in the market, you know, 1.0, because otherwise you'll keep refining that product. Um, you know, I have my half a dozen products that are sitting on the shelves. <laughs> uh, we, we never go to market with those products in my, my early career. Yeah, I think... Um, as you start to look at how many ideas you throw away, I think it's important as all entrepreneurs, um, knowing that not every idea is a good idea. And there is a difference between having an idea and the market being ready for the idea. So I like to put checkpoints in, in place for myself and, and other executives as well, which says, is this the right uh, product? Is this the right market? And is this the right time? Right, right, right. You know, a good friend of mine, he said, you're your best investments are the ones that you never made, right? So you, <laughs> cut, <laughs> you cut your losses as fast as you can. So if you put the product out there, 1.0 version, and all of a sudden you start to see the traction, you know you have something. If you even if, you, if the customers don't pay for it, they give you the feedback and use it, that in itself is, is huge versus yeah. keep working on the product and uh, falling in love with your idea and never making money off of it. How would you say a founder knows that they need to cut bait? When, when, 
when nobody's paying or nobody's using the product. Uh, yeah, I think those are two good keys, usage and then on buying signals. Yeah. Excellent. Awesome. Well, I did not see any other questions come through, uh, but if you guys do have them, uh, please feel free to reach out to our amazing speakers. Manoj, uh, Nicole, thank you again so much for your time and sharing your wisdom with all of us today. Uh, and thank you all for joining. Again, if you have questions, please reach uh, out to them and you'll receive this recording in your inbox tomorrow. So thank you. Have a wonderful afternoon, everyone. Great. Awesome. Thanks, Ariana. Thanks, Nicole. Thank you. Thanks, everyone.